So without any further delay or interruption, let me hand the floor over to my dear friend and distinguished visitor, Lucy Luzema, who will address us <coughs> on the subject of Palestinian women and nonviolence, a kind of catch-all title which allows her to do pretty much whatever she wants to, and we will be privileged with whatever we do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think the last time we saw each other before seeing each other here was when we were actually living in the old city. We had, I think, one of the coolest addresses. It was number 58, Via Dolorosa. And we were actually right along the Via Dolorosa with the Echo Homo Arch coming out of our house. If any of you have been to the Holy City or know your Bible well enough, that's something that felt, we felt really privileged to live there. And I think that's where we last saw it. So. It's really she time since, but that's all right. Anyway, <laughs> it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you for the invitation and for the pleasure and privilege of meeting you and talking with you. Um, as Ben mentioned, I set up about eight years ago a non profit organization. And this is basically what we believe that it is smarter without violence. And this is what many Palestinians also believe, contrary to what many newspapers say and many television channels say. And a lot of my work is really around breaking the stereotype of Palestinians as violent. It's also exploring different ways to deal with violence, different ways of uh, helping to solve problems. And it has something to do with women. I just going back to the title there. But I myself don't believe that women are intrinsically less violent than men. I think we're all probably a little violent some of the time. And that we can all do a lot of work on ourselves and on others to really work towards making a less violent world. And in particular, in a, an ugly conflict situation, I think the only way you can break that conflict is to absolutely go away from violence. If you work with violence, you will actually increase the need. There's no way you can break the cycle. You have to be prepared to go in the opposite direction. And this is, this is the I don't know how much background any of you have about the conflict in the Middle East. I think it's very hard to get an accurate view. As Ben mentioned, I've had the pleasure of being at the Kennedy School this last year. I've actually been going back each month for about a week or 10 days to keep up with my organization. And even so, I feel quite out of touch. It's extraordinary how quickly one loses touch. But it's a really very, very difficult situation for everyone to live in, for both Israelis and Palestinians. And I will speak from the Palestinian point of view, because that's what I know, and that's the experience that I've had. And it's a situation where Israel has more power than the Palestinians. It's not an equal conflict. It's also not a conflict that has gone on it's a recent political conflict. So all these things mean that it could be solved. There is actually a reason for it. It's not something that has always been there. People used to be friends with each other. It used to be an open, tolerant society. That's why there are still many Christians who live in Jerusalem. There are Armenians <coughs> who live Jerusalem who came there as refugees because they thought that was a safe place to be. Now it tends to be put out as Muslim terrorists, people who can make you scared even to go there. But this is unfair and untrue. And historically, it's extremely unfair. So it's something that began with a political movement just over 100 years ago several major wars which have made the situation worse. I 
wasn't so, there wasn't much interest in, in working with my minds. And I thought that I would set up an organization to educate and train persons in the potential of working with alternatives to violence. And I set up the organization with the acronym MEND, Middle East Nonviolence and Democracy, in 1998, and started working with schools because schools are a good place to start. They are an integral part of society. There are always problems of violence in schools. Again, just to give you an idea of the level of overcrowding, many schools work on two shifts, and that means two total shifts that you will have a principal and a set of staff and a set of kids that go from maybe, oh, I think it's usually 7.30 to 12 or 12.30, and then you get another set. They come in at 1 o'clock and take over for the afternoon to a quarter of one. Completely different principal and set of staff, everything. There are no staff rooms, no luxuries like that for people to actually meet each other in, um, in a school setting. Um, it's, it's a very harsh environment. The education system is very short. People just learn things by rote. And so I started working in schools, taking the one free class they had for activities, working with the most difficult class of kids through psychodrama, through art therapy, through different creative approaches. Working also giving workshops for the entire staff. It was a holistic approach that involved working with staff, including the principal, and the kids, and the families of the children, so that people would be on the same page when they would be working with one person. And this we continue doing. And it's developed now so that we're working now very closely with school counselors, with the most mainstream education development program for them in alternatives to violence and um, how to, to deal with um, violent situations in schools. And out of this, we also, there's, we have a lot of programs. <coughs> there's about four pillars of men's work. Basically, there's education, working with schools and school counselors, and working also with um, Sesame Street, who we've done a number of projects with producing educational materials. This. The message in this book is two things. And here's also a bag that goes with it. I understand from Ben that a lot of you learn Arabic, so you can try your Arabic on it afterwards if you like. But um, <coughs> the idea behind this is, is one of empowerment. This one is called all about I can, and encouraging children to read. This is a broad definition of nonviolence. It's taking the definition that violence cuts off your potential. Violence of any kind, emotional, physical, it cuts off your potential to do so. And nonviolence does the other way, it develops your potential. So, any of the work that's done with nonviolence inevitably increases your options and brings you awareness of choice. This is one of the basics about nonviolence. Once you start to be aware that you have choice, you start to be aware also that you can take different actions and uh, work with them. So we work with education. We have worked also, uh, things develop, different projects develop one after the other. And inevitably, when the violence started in September 2000, we moved a lot to really working with crisis management with schools and helping kids to be traumatized, teachers to be traumatized. And an example, of, just to show you how traumatized the kids can be in that situation. Um, I went to a group where they had a piece of paper with some dots to join up. Some of the dots formed a triangle, and some of them formed a square. And there was a picture of a triangle and a picture of a square. And this class of perfectly normal 14 year old children were asked to join up the dots. There are triangular dots for a triangle and a square for a square and not a single child could do that. And it was nothing to do with cognitive ability, it was to do with concentration. But they were so frightened and so traumatized that they could not, some of them finished it, they were given about 10 minutes, it was a long time. And one by one they just gave up and gave these pieces of paper back to other people because they couldn't concentrate on to see it, to focus on the dots. So there's lots of really major So we worked a lot with that. And one of the things 
rural community centers where the libraries and computers and um, educational games so that people can uh, have somewhere to go because, again, it's hard to imagine if you come from Boston just how many people you can have in that situation. This is talking about places where there's nothing. There. There's no cinema. Nothing. The main meeting place is the school. That's the primary meeting area. Occasionally there are youth clubs and some of the bigger towns. There's very, very little meeting to do. It's the population with the highest television watching rate in the world. Okay, so we've set up a lot of community centers. Um, we organize summer camps for youth. Not along the lines of the dialogue summer camps that I've seen, but dialogue with people just from one side of the conflict. Because this, I think, of actually the, the experience I saw for this out. We had, for instance, the first year kids, Palestinian kids, and kids from South Africa, black South Africa. <coughs> and then the following year we had kids also from the Northern Ireland. And then again the, the, the year off. And it was fantastic because when you're just from one side of the conflict, you can actually share your experience with someone else. There's something to do, there's, there's a problem in a conflict that people see themselves as victims and tend to, to dwell on what it's like to be a victim. <coughs> and it's something, it's not wrong, but it, it can get awfully unhealthy. And it can weaken you rather than powerful. Whereas when you're with other people, you can also look at your strengths. When you're with other people, you can also be in a you start to look at your strengths. And this again is part of the approach of my organization is to really look at where people are strong and to build out, build up the, the resilience. This is something I shall come to again in a minute to talk about women, which I'll focus on towards the end, because I think Palestinian women are an incredible example of resilience. quite a lot with media work. We have now, in the last couple of years, we've been broadcasting Radio Soap which promotes non-violence. It's a love story. It centers around the kid who drops out of school and then gets into problems because he's violent, and then the other one, who, uh, and another boy who opts for non-violence with the girl trying to choose between them. Now, this again may not sound so extraordinary, but there are no locally produced soap operas in Palestine, whether TV or radio. There are no radio soap operas there at all. The people listen almost all the time to the radio. It's, it's a very, very politicized society. People are glued to whatever's going on in the news just because it's, it's, a, it's, it's partly because it's a conflict and that sucks you into it. People start to think that this is all that is in the world. But it's also because there's actually a lot that goes on can be dangerous. So people stay glued to the radio. So to hear this radio so often that promotes all that is something that gives people a totally different angle. And it's good because this is one of the ways we can overcome the uh, problem of people not being able to move around from one place to another. Radios, we can reach Gaza, which I haven't been able to visit for about 10 years, for instance. So it's a way to, to get over that. And now we're just starting on the third series for this. And we are also working by writing a curriculum <coughs> to go with it, so we will take it to schools and to clubs for discussion so that teachers will be able, we will train teachers to work with this curriculum and have the kids listen and discuss and analyze so that it's, it, it will be a really uh, widespread reach through this project. Um, also, I, I like to work with film, and there's a method I've used. First of all, I used it with a project with some girls' schools. It's called participatory film, and it's like it sounds. It's, it's training people in video making, but in a very participatory way, with a small group of people who interact and take it in turns to actually learn how to do the film. And what's interesting about this is that it makes you somehow come to terms with your image the sound of your voice as you're 
actually learning to film, you're at the same time learning how to be filmed. And it has this, this kind of transformative effect on how you can express yourself. Uh, what kind of uh, film you can come up with. Someone once described it to me as a tool of revolution, which, which it is now. It was developed a long time ago by community workers in England. But then they had huge video cameras and masses of paraphernalia they had to take with them. Now all you need is, is a good digital camera. And you can just make your own films and put your voice everywhere. So it's, it's a fantastic method. We, we've done a number of projects. We did a, a one um, particularly with women in this where we train women in active non-violence and in gender and human rights. And then we trained a smaller group of them just in the participation video. And they made two films to show how women, well really the first one was to show an example of what violence does to women and how terrible it is. And the second one again focused on the idea of resilience. And how women to the woman who uh, had waited six years to have a child. And then she, when she was in labor, she was stopped at the Israeli military checkpoint in the hospital. And her baby died now of two as a result. And not only this was bad enough, but her family, her husband's family, One of the odd things though about this one was that this woman also had a girl already. It was the son she was waiting for. So you get a lot of different messages about gender and importance, gender in society. The other film showed a woman who had had her house destroyed by the Israeli military authorities, something that happens very frequently. And that's also very common. Um, and how she had insisted on getting education, although the family were against it, and she married the man she wanted to marry, and how even though he was taken as a political prisoner, she was paid with her studies, how she found over it. So, if you were determined to overcome really every kind of obstacle, whether it's a family obstacle, a traditional obstacle, an occupation obstacle. I want to get now, though, to the, um, uh, the main project that I've been working on for the last two or three years. It's one that developed out of the work with the community service and schools. Um, for those of you who know the political scene, the Catholic movement is the main political party. So it's partly against the leading movement. I was approached about three years ago by some activists from within the Catholic movement said, we would like to know about this non-violence. We're fed up. We just have had enough violence. We want a future for our kids. We want to be able to make a state that we can live with and don't want violence as part of this state. And we want, we want to learn about non-violence. So, since then, we've worked. I have a team of trainers. First of all, they were trained by people from different parts of the world, and now they do their own training. And we have centers in the different cities in the West Bank. Our headquarters are in Jerusalem, but we have offices in Ramallah, in Tokarim, in Janine, in Kalkindia, which is a town completely surrounded by this terrible separation wall. about non-violence is that you need to have support within it. If you 
you want to be violent, you can hit someone on your own. You can do things in a dictatorial way. If, you, if you're working with non-violence, you really need a lot of support. And you have to build up the support and affinity groups and deal with all the problems that can come up through non-violent action and make sure you have a really strong support network. So this is the stage at which we're at now. We're building up this support network with the activists around the West Bank. And these, again, these are leaders. They're not people who are on the fringes. These are leaders within the Fatah movement and within the trade union movement. It was the head of the whole of Palestinian trade unions who lent us his office in Nablus for the training. And Kalkia is the Fatah offices that, that we used initially for the training. We have the support of key people in the mainstream. And as a result of the credibility of these activists, a lot more people <coughs> are interested. There's a huge groundswell of interest. And you know, it's basically a reflection. He was me for a long time. But it's also an understanding that this is the way to get to it. And I think it's something tremendously, it, 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 tremendously powerful actually, and something that needs to be worked with at this time. I'm sure you all know that there was a new Palestinian president elected in January. When I was back in January, I heard so much optimism. I heard everyone say, it's about, we gave our vote for peace. I heard even kids in Tulkarim, in a place in the West Bank where I think the week before two children had been killed. These kids were saying to me, you know, we've, we've never met Israelis, we're really curious. They were thinking ahead to a new peace process and really feeling quite excited. Already, this is this is actually losing momentum. It's something that it it needs to be encouraged. It needs some kind of political gain if it will be, if it will be sustained. So. It's hard to know really how, how much longer it will last, but it's sure that for now people are really wanting to say no to violence as much as possible. I think we've seen this towards the end of the news again. You can see this, and just today there were elections in two of the major universities, and the extremist Islamic actually lost these elections. The Fatah movement won, and that's considered a really interesting and optimistic in Biazet and Bethlehem, which is it's quite something. It was it was very close. It was it was just winning, but it's still an indication of, of optimism and belief and trust in the, the approach of the new president that really we can stick non-violent way forward, this is the way to, to get peace and uh, to, to build a future. I don't know, how, um, am I okay for time there? I think you can do yeah. right. If you have another five, is it ten minutes okay. of remarks, and, or if you wish to stop here and take questions, you Okay, you know what, I just, I just wanted to say one, a, a, a couple more things then. One is, it's easy to think about the future if you live in a place like this. If you live somewhere where there are no job prospects, and where you can't even leave, Palestinians can't move. I said this before, it's so hard to imagine that you can't travel, you can't move out of the town, there are no economic opportunities. How do you live? People have no future. And I, again, I attend some of the workshops that I do, and I was struck going to a workshop with the kids in a school in Jerusalem where people actually can move a little bit more than in other places. And this was in 1999. It was when there was still the effect of peace process, not when there was the kind of mess that's been going on in these programs. It was class of kids, maybe 22, and the facilitator asked them a normal question, what would you like to be? What would you like to do? They were maybe 15, 16 years old. <coughs> I don't know what reaction you would I'm sure someone would speak up and say so. In this case, nothing. What's going to happen? He's sad. Shut up. One of them, after 
was an extraordinarily dynamic and successful three-day consultation where people, all of us, really just managed to talk about how to solve the problem. There didn't seem to be any major differences. Although some of the women were Israeli religious Jews and some of the Palestinians, there was one because it was not everyone's very left wing. The left wing Palestinian now considers herself one of the leaders of Palestinian nonviolence. So and the, there's been a lot of contact. This group still meets. They asked to meet with Condoleezza Rice, I know they sent her a letter. And um, I think that this is one of the ways forward that not through through anything but perhaps just through through the desire to make it work. specific goals for the work that you do? How would you know whether what you're doing is succeeding? And then finally, if you were successful, how do you envision that change in Palestinian-Israeli relations and the political situation? Okay. Um, maybe I, can I begin at the end? Um, because the, the project that I mentioned where we're setting up, we've set up these eight um, nonviolent centers in Palestinian towns. This is actually done as it's funded by the European Union under its Partnerships for Peace program. So we have actually a partner in the Hebrew University, and they're doing action-oriented research about the nonviolence that we are working on. So already we've made a short film, which is with some of the activists, which has been shown to media experts and academic experts in the Hebrew University. And they will be organizing polls. They've done their own preliminary I'm sorry, actually, I had to bring it. I forgot that I could email it to you. Like. Because that shows that if Palestinians can be perceived as being essentially nonviolent rather than violent, this can transform the whole Israeli attitude to peace and borders and the whole essential need for security. And this is the premise on which I've been working, but it was very nice have it documented by some research done by the Truman Institute. It's, um, it's actually one of the... At the Hebrew University. At the Hebrew University, yeah. They're, they're a peace research institute. And again, uh, <coughs> there are polls done recently that show a high proportion of the population on both sides want peace, but are not aware of how many people on the other side actually want peace and how much people are prepared to give up for their peace. But if Palestinians in seem to be against violence and for non-violent methods of solving the conflict. I think this I think this is more important than any non-violent action actually. It's really a question of changing the perceptions because so much the other issue that I didn't mention because I thought I was running out of time is the whole question of perceptions and misperceptions and how much people project and reflect all the confusion of ideas about the conflict. So in terms of how we work, this is a little book by Professor Jean Sharp, who lives in Boston, who is one of the authorities on active nonviolence. He doesn't like to call it nonviolence, he likes to call it nonviolent struggle. And he comes at the very practical end of the scale. If you have Gandhi, who likes to win people over, then Martin Luther King, who works pretty much in the middle, sometimes you win people, sometimes you, you work a bit more uh, aggressively. And Jean Sharp really believes in active nonviolence in a way that you look at where the power is and you go for, you do your research and you aim at the power. This 
not this particular book, but a similar one that he wrote. This is called, for those that don't read Arabic, There Are Realistic Alternatives. Okay, he wrote another one called From Dictatorship to Democracy, which was translated, I discovered after doing this, it was translated and used by Otkul in uh, the Balkans. It was really what Tolkien and Osovich was Jim uh, Sharp's little book. So uh, these things are, are good tools. What we work with in particular though, is to start just helping people deal with their anger. It, there's a lot of psychology involved in just how you deal with your anger and with your frustration so that then you can catch your problems. When there are problems, you can problem with your violence. And in terms of nonviolent action, I find it hard to come up with specific examples, but I can tell you that, for instance, on May the 22nd, I believe there are going to be lots of kites led up by both Israelis and Palestinians. That seems to me to be a beautiful example of a nonviolent action, just showing how many people would like peace in a, in a very nonviolent way. Another thing we did was to train some kids, in, just do some workshops around democracy and around giving them an idea of the future. If you remember, I think we lost it. So we, it was a project called Stones for the Future of Palestine. It was just a one-day workshop in lots of different refugee camps and towns. And the kids discussed what they wanted and brought back a sense of the future. And then each one took a stone and painted on it or wrote on it what they wanted. And then they put the stone into a sculpture on the hill or in their school to, to show something concrete that they were building for the future. So these kind of things, they don't have to be one Israeli, actually, when I was talking in one of his focus groups, was an Israeli suggesting maybe someone could upset the sewage system. And that's also perhaps a different kind of mobile attention. So there are many things that, that can be done. There, there is a lot of more violence. Palestinian prisoners went on hunger strike for months last summer. I don't think it was reported. Although British Airways threatened to go on strike. It's a question also of the media attention. There's always a lot of strikes and marches and peaceful demonstrations. These things are useless, it seems to me, unless they get media attention. The main thing is to to change this idea about Palestinians and violence. And that makes me do it. So it needs to be a media or a thing. I actually wanted to pick up that question of media, which I've been thinking about before you raised it. Okay. Uh, what techniques can be used and what means of reaching the media decision makers do you think there are that would get that kind of coverage? Let's take the kite example. Now, in one respect, that's a wonderful <coughs> kind of an event. Mm -hmm. Lots of colored kites flying around in the air. It's a good image. Um, but how do you get to them? I mean, how do you get to the people who make the decisions about what gets covered and what doesn't get covered? And do you have any facilities or any people who are actually working just on that aspect, the PR aspect of this whole process? We have within our media centers now, our, our, our nonviolent centers, we have people responsible for media. But it's a very small country, and it has more journalists per head than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> So, but the main problem is that people, again, cannot get around. Israelis are not allowed into the West Bank. So Israeli journalists are ruled out. International journalists can often have a very hard time also moving from one place to another. And this, but I was in a discussion about, about this problem. And one thing that can be done is really just to raise awareness among the journalists. Apparently, there's, there's a German that they have called Southern Eye or something, Southern Queer, name which can discuss issues like why isn't there enough coverage of non violence. There were some people last week, some social entrepreneurs, who wanted to have a big splash. This is the guy who set up East <coughs> and some of them around LA around there. And they wanted to have a major media event around showing a film about Gandhi's life which they'd arranged to have done in Toronto. And I think even they didn't get enough. I saw very little coverage, but they had done a lot of work with 
with CNN, 60 Minutes, they worked very, very hard, with top PR. It's part of the battle. It's, again, just because it's so crucial, it's a lot of the battle is just getting the media coverage, getting it done, so that it reaches out. I've, I've occasionally been interviewed by people when things get out, so that other people get it. And often things will start. I will get approached by people who are interested, and then I will hear nothing more. So I get the feeling that things get stopped by our nonviolence. Is, but it changes where the battle is. If you know. It changes the kind of battle. But it's still, it's still good. <coughs> because <coughs> if you want to change things by changing the perception of the Palestinians, how is it perceived? There will be people who don't want this done, who don't want to allow it. So it's it's not. I don't know if that answers you, but uh, it's not simple. Even if one has plenty of contacts. I'm just curious. How many people in this in this room have anything to do with the communications department? Uh, uh, what are you aware of in terms of, of the kinds of um, of instincts that people involved in communications have in responding to these kinds of, of questions? Have you given it any thought? Have you looked at this at all? Um, interesting. I mean, it's maybe true in the PR. I think it really comes daily on the PR. Actually, I remember the Tom Major and the police who studies my next summer occurred to me that a lot of the PR work needs to be done in the college of the journey. So maybe you could be doing that. Yeah. Help, help change the consciousness. Yeah. It was an office run by Michael Tarazi and Diane, I forget Diane. Uh, Butu, yes. That disappeared. What was They're coming for? back again. I think they've been rehired. They were part okay. of something called the negotiation assignment. And now there's been a lot of reshuffling. A few emails from that office about using their name. No, I think I think they're going back. I think it may be under a different umbrella. But there's a huge amount of work. I think it's it's one of the most important areas. And they were they're good, but they need a much bigger team and a much wider reaching team to <coughs> because so much of this is really unfair standard. And this just hardens people's fears and keeps people locked in a situation. I hear it as rumor, at least, that uh, Hanan Ashrawi is likely to become the Palestinian representative ambassador in Washington. I don't know whether this is true, but I can confirm. But I would think that if she were there, with her sense of American media, the brink would be built around that. I've heard that also. I've heard it several times. And I also heard there was even another person, also a very good speaker called Hanna Senora, who even came to Washington, gave up his job at Jerusalem and came. But the current PLO ambassador in Washington is to be a silly move. I can't think of a more <laughs> diplomatic way of putting it, but he, he uh, apparently is, is permanent. So uh, although I think Hanna would do an excellent job, I agree. She has to do it more as a public university or something like that. It's a sincere thing. I think it is a
Sorry, everything was politicized. When women's committees were set up in the 1980s, they all, each political party, set up women's groups, set up clinics, they have something that goes with being politically active. Because again, in a situation like Palestinians, until there was a government in 1992, there really was no way that you could have these things. So it's it's something that's normal, that there would be a social component. Hamas is perceived as efficient and less corrupt. I don't know if that's true. They are, but this is how, how they are perceived. And I'm not sure about, about people actually voting for that. I think, I think it's perhaps the idea of efficiency. But it's also, yeah, if, if you're hopeless, you tend to turn more to a extremist position. When there were elections in Palestine in 1996, the first elections, then the support for Hamas was 3%. So, because people really knew they were coming together to vote for the state. It's, I think it's more of a reflection I know the, the Palestinian Authority gets a lot of bad press, but they do a lot of good work, especially in the health and education sector. I think amazing work in education. I mean, even if you like when the violence started in, in 2000, and people were under curfew in one part of the world, and not under curfew. And curfew means 24 hours around the clock. You're not allowed out. You will be allowed out maybe for an hour or two. When this was going on in Hitler, the Ministry of Education arranged for the classes in the open part of the town to be filmed, and then they broadcast them on local TV so that the other kids could have access to those classes. You know, be, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Planning, there's a lot that goes on in really very difficult circumstances. Now they do a lot through video conferencing to keep the little parts of the ministries together and to, to get around the problems. So Hamas is a really better, I think, in our resources. I think it's just it's it's more that people people turn to them because they they just they feel hopeless about everything else. And sometimes it's easier when things are put more in black and white terms when the world is more in color. But don't forget Israel's job. Something that happened immediately in 1967 with the Israeli occupation was they immediately created captive markets. They had a supply of construction workers within the Palestinians who could come and build the Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And they had a, a dumping ground for Israeli products. And that relationship, that's how it's continued. And I think of around a third of the Palestinians, at least, comes through Palestinians working. Israel. In, in 1987, Palestinians used nonviolence a lot in terms of the labor then. That was, that was a, a time when, apart from throwing stones, which some people say is violence, a lot of people can see that point and say, yes, stones can be conceived <coughs> as, as violence. That uprising was essentially 
and it was strategic. It involved people not licensing their cars, people refusing to stay part of the Israeli system. The policemen who had worked with Israel and Palestinians who worked with the policemen resigned en masse and they were all back. And the workers, particularly in the citrus groves, who would come from Gaza to pick the, the Jaffa oranges and these, they all went on strike. And that created a huge problem for Israel. It was really one of the most difficult uh, times in Israel. They were stuck and they tried in the end, they brought workers from Thailand and other countries, which is what they did now. It's, it's extraordinary. I think on planes going from Jordan, but they walk around. It's good. 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 It really caused severe economic problems at that stage. But, of course, because it worked once, it then becomes harder to do it again. So, actually, Palestinians are more dependent on the income from Israel because there's no way Palestinians can develop their own economy. The, what was developing moderately okay between 1993 and 2000, most of it got smashed. There are about 30 people businesses that keep going. And they keep going really oddly enough by exports. There are pharmaceutical companies that export to Eastern Europe. There are marble stone companies that export to China and the United States. This is how the businesses actually keep going. And there are very few. And they keep going into the, the service industries as well. Computers and models and computers and things. But there's very little Last question. I was going to suggest uh, that we then to move to an informal stage because we'll have a, 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 a reception and we can continue the conversation that way. But if it's a short question, then please uh, go ahead. Yeah, short question. Sure. Uh, in response to my question before about the, the content of your work, following up on your opening remark, you said that it was very important to change the perception mm -hmm. of the Palestinians as violence. And I would imagine that in the course of your work and presumably with Israelis that you work with, you would find also perhaps that Palestinians have misperceptions of the Israelis. And I was wondering what some of those perceptions might be. When uh, Sesame Street were first moving in to, to do their TV production, they did some research among three-year-old children, because the age, target age for Sesame Street is uh, eight to eight. They found that already three-year-old children had quite strong stereotypes of the other side. Most Palestinians see Israelis as soldiers of violence, and the Israelis were seeing Palestinians as dirty. So, yes, there are, but on the other hand, because Palestinians, you know, they, when you're underneath, you tend to know the people on top of you a little bit better. I mean, the, for sure there are some misperceptions. But Palestinians watch a lot of Israeli television. Many of them know Hebrew. A lot of them spend time in Israeli prisons and learn Hebrew and get to know Israelis. There's, there isn't actually real hostility. As I said at the beginning, it's not something that's, that's deep hatred. It's something based on a political problem. If the political problem is solved, a lot of the other stuff will go. What there is, though, that to me seems to worse is a lot of humiliation. 
I don't know. Have you visited the region? Yes. So you know maybe what it's like then to come up to a roadblock and have someone just tell you you can't go to. I can't say that I've experienced that. I can only say that I've heard the reports of experiences of people who did experience that. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's something it, it cannot feel very humiliating when it's done to keep you waiting, to sit on the back. There are many different state of nature with no government for a long time and a flourishing civil society with lots of organizations that have sprung up and taken care of people's needs. You have free and fair elections among prisoners and Palestinian among Palestinian political prisoners. You've had, I think, pretty successful presidential elections. And you know the Palestinians are actually an example of democracy in 